In this video, we're going to take a look at micro front end architecture design. So in this video specifically, we're going to take a look at what is micro front end and why we should use it. What are some pros and cons of using this architecture? Then we're going to build a simple React application using micro front end module federation. And then the timestamps of this video is in the description of this video. So you can feel free to jump to any sections that you like. So if that sounds interesting, let's get started. So let's take a look at what is micro front end. So micro front end is basically a microservice that exists within the browser. So in traditional, we have the monolith architecture where we have the front end code and the back end code all exist within one single code base. But then as our application getting more complex and large, then we want to divide the front end and the back end into two different code base. So the front end team focus on the front end code and the back end team focus on the back end code. And then as our back end getting more complex, we also could have multiple services. For example, we have a payment service, a basket service, and so on and so forth. And just like the back end microservices, the front end code can get in more complex as well. And we can also divide our front end code into different code base. And here you can see we have team checkout, team product, team search, and each team and each code base have a different mission. So for example, product team, the goal is to present the products. And here you can see we have an example of a page. This On this web page, we have web team product, which handles the entire product displaying page. And then the team checkout will be the basket and the this and the buy button for a user to purchase the product. And then we also have Team Inspire where we are displaying the product recommendations on the page. So basically you can see that micro front end architecture basically divides this responsibility into multiple parts on the browser. And each micro front end have its own code base and responsibility. Okay, so let's take a look at why we should use micro front end architecture. So the first reason that, that I could think of is the scalability and reusability reason. So for scalability, we can be able to divide the application into multiple domains. So for example, we could have the product team focus on the, just the product side, and we have a cart team that focus on just the cart application. And we also could have the transaction team and so on and so forth. Each of those micro front end are reusable and can also be reused in other front end microservice. And the second reason that I could think of is reliability. So, so let's say if one of the micro front end service failed, it will not affect the entire application. So for example, let's say the car team relies on the product team using some um, functions or components inside of the product MFE, as well as the transaction MFE. And if one of those service breaks, it will not affect the entire application, right? Obviously there will be fallbacks and such, but it will not cause the entire application to fail. And the third reason that I could think of is technology flexible. So it's not limited to any particular framework or language. We can be able to use React in one part of our front end application and other part of our front end service are using in completely different language or completely different framework that supports micro front end. And of course, the other reason is that they will have their own CI CD pipeline, their own testing, their own deployment, the whole process. So let's take a look at why we should not use micro front end architecture for our application. One of the disadvantage of micro front end architecture is excessive coupling. There could be excessive coupling, which drive up the complexity of the application. Now, the other reason is the increase in cost. In this case, we are creating more repository, more pipelines, which drive up the cost. We're trying to build a simple application that's not very complex. Okay, so to get started, first, we're going to create two React application inside of our demo folder. So let's open our terminal and then we're going to run npx. And then we're going to create the first application. We're going to name it name, app one. And then we're also going to open another terminal. We're going to do the same. We're going to call it um, app two. So once we have everything installed, then we're going to CD into app one and app two. Then we're going to install some packages. So in this case, we're installing Webpack, Babel, and some other dependencies. So let's run this. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to create our component and set up our Webpack. So in this case here, you can see inside of our app one, um, we have everything is installed using React. And then here inside of our source, I have go ahead and create a component called button.js. And inside of this component, I just have a div. And then here you can see it says button one. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to run this and you can see here, I have a button also added inside of our app.js. So in this case, if I want to run our webpack, uh, what, what I can do is so first I seed into app one and then I run yarn 
will pack. And you can see that it giving us an error and it basically tells us that we need to define our Webpack config file. So here you can see that the mode option has not been set. So it doesn't know if we're using production mode or development mode. So what we can do is inside of our app one, uh, we're going to basically create a webpack.config file. And I already created this. And here you can see I have defined the mode to be development. And then um, the server, so the port is run on 8083. And then here you can see we also have defined some rules. Like here, we're also asked Babel to compile any file with extension of JavaScript. And then we're also going to exclude no modules. Then we're going to specify that we're using Babel loader to load or and compile the files. And then we're also setting some options. And here you can see we also define the plugins. So this here you can see um, if we were to run Yarn Babel, uh, sorry, Yarn Webpack is also going to generate a disk folder inside of our app one. And this disk folder um, is basically what we're going to use for uh, deployment or deploying our, um, our, our, our code to, for example, S3 or um, any other deployment platforms, right? So here you can see we're using index.html uh, inside of our pu public to generate this, this folder. So in this case, once we have our Webpack, Webpack config file uh, is configured, then if we were to run yarn Webpack, you can see that we have our this folder created. And if we were to um, just run yarn Webpack serve to basically run our application, you can see that uh, it is successful and we're able to view our application in localhost 83. 83. Okay, as you can see, uh, once we visit our localhost 8083, you can see that we have our app one and button one uh, rendered in, in our web page. So if we were to go ahead and change something, for example, if we change this to button two, and you can see that is also displayed inside of our web browser. Okay, so now once we have the webpack set up, now what we're gonna do is we're going to um, set up our module federation plugins. So here I'm going to import module, module federation and then we're going to put model federation plugins in the plugins um, list. And here you can see first we specify the name, which is gonna be the name of the React application that we're using which is app one. And then we're also going to have a file name which is called remoteentry.js. So this file basically exports all the modules that we're going to, um, that contains all the modules that we're going to export. And then here, which is the exposes. So this, this basically um, is an object which we can specify what are the components that we're going to um, expose, right? So here you can see we have our button which is uh, from this one. And this is what we want to expose so that we can be able to use this component in other micro front-end applications. And here, if we if we were to remote refresh, you can see that we have stuff here in our remote entry.js. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to use the button component that we've created from app one inside of our app two. So inside of our app two, we don't have the webpack config file. So we need to just copy the app uh, webpack config, config file from app one and then use the same paste it inside of our app too. And obviously we're gonna change a couple of things. So for example, it cannot run on the same port. So we're gonna change the port to 82. And then we're going to um, change the name to be app two inside of our module federation plugins. And then we're not gonna export anything. So we're going to keep this as empty. Then we're going to add remote property inside of our module federation plugin. And here you can see we're going to um, import the remote entry.js from the app one. So we have app one, and then this is going to be app one at that's the local host uh, port, and then the remote entry.js. So now, if we were to also run yarn webpack serve, let's try to run this, and you can see it is successful. It is currently on port 8082. Let's take a look at that. So here you can see inside of our ho local host 8082, we have our app to displayed inside of our browser. So then in this case, if we want to display the button or in this case, button from app one, we can be able to import this here. Um, in this case, we're using react.lazy if we want to um, render the component asynchronously. So uh, you don't have to, but here you can see we are importing app one slash button, and then we have the button component, and then we're going to 
add this inside of our app component and you can see that we have button two displayed inside of our 8882. Now here in this case, if I want to go to button.js from app one and if I were to change the text of this, so for example, I wanna to change to button three and then here, if we were to refresh this, you can see that it changed to button three. So it basically, when it refresh, it basically fetched the remote entry from the app one and render the component in the app two.